Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen, who is risen indeed. Amen. We return to our gospel reading. You can follow in your service folders if you wish. Permit me to read one verse in review. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we are excited at the news of your resurrection. One week does not diminish that. This is great news for our salvation, for we know that in you we live because you live. Bless us then, Lord, through this truth. Your word is truth. Amen. To the people of God, is everything back to normal? Has the Easter dust settled? Have all the eggs been found in your backyard by the kids? Has your leftover ham already been frozen or turned into soup? Well, then that must mean Easter's over. Because your last lily on your plant is finally opening up and your first lily is already turned brown. Easter must be over. No, it's not. The church year provides for six Sundays of Easter after the holiday to make sure that the themes and the words of Easter never fade. In fact, for that matter, they never should fade all year through. The prescribed readings for the second Sunday of Easter reintroduce us to that familiar post-Easter doubting villain named Thomas. We know him well. He's famous because of his episode a week after Jesus rose from the grave. We know him as Doubting Thomas. But before we carry this villain label a little bit too far, there are lessons to be learned from Thomas which will help us in our life of faith. We note how Thomas's attitude changes as Jesus molds and shapes his heart and patiently works with Thomas to discover that believing is seeing. You have to first battle the doubts, though, and then see the proof. When it comes to convincing someone of the facts, we... We have the same mindset, perhaps, of the people that live in Missouri. I don't know if anybody comes from Missouri here, but the Missouri license plate says the show me state. And historians claim anyway that that means that in time past, people had to prove what it was they were saying as being believable. For instance, if I told you that I had caught a 34-inch, 11-pound walleye, I know there would be some out there who would say, oh, that's great. Now show me the picture. Levi is a great organist, isn't he? But if I told you I had an organ concert at the Chapel of the Christ in New Ulm, Minnesota, at Martin Luther College, you would say, oh, that's great. I didn't know you could play organ. But now let's hear a live stream of your concert. If I told you that my wife's potato salad was better than anybody else's in Wisconsin, you seasoned cooks out there would say, oh, sure. Then have her bring it to our holy smoke weekend and we'll taste it. And then we'll see. Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching. You rely on those senses to prove to yourself that which is unbelievable to be true. And we heard all kinds of it in our first John reading too. John uses the same approach of the senses to try to get people to understand and to believe what he is saying is true. 
we have that before us. Ten disciples huddled together behind closed doors on Easter night, scared to death. Scared to death of the Jewish leaders who are going to try to seek them out and persecute them, if not kill them. Because they figured they were the ones that would continue to spread this rumor that Jesus is alive. After all, they were with him, so let's get rid of them. They were scared. Probably shocked a little bit over Jesus' empty tomb, too. Jesus suddenly appears to show the disciples that he was indeed alive and told them, peace be with you. Have peace in your hearts over these troubled doubts that you have. Have peace in your hearts in knowing that I completed the mission for which my father sent me. Peace be with you. Oh, how they needed that. They had doubts and misgivings about the rumor Jesus was alive. It was hard to get their arms around this news the women had brought from the grave. So Jesus showed them his hands and his feet and engaged their senses of sight, of touch, of hearing. So they wouldn't have to battle their doubts about the news of his resurrection because for them, believing is seeing. But Thomas wasn't there for that first appearance, unfortunately. For a whole week, he had been hearing from his comrades, Jesus is alive, we've seen him, we saw him in the flesh, we talked with him, we saw him with our own eyes. But Thomas doesn't buy it. His reaction is not good. You think he might say, really guys, you saw him? What did he say? What did he look like? How were hands? How were his hands, his feet, his side? Were they still bleeding? What, what did he say? When are we going to see him again? He didn't say any of that. Instead, Thomas earns his villain doubter reputation and doesn't believe the disciples. He spent the last week sticking to his own story of what he had seen. Jesus suffering Jesus crucified, Jesus dead, Jesus buried. Those were the images seared in his mind and he couldn't get them out of his head. This can't be that he's alive. For a whole week, Thomas believed in a dead savior instead of a risen one. Thomas battled his doubts and demanded more proof. Those infamous words, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails, put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Seeing wasn't enough for Thomas. He needed more senses involved. I have to see the nail marks. I have to touch the holes in his hands. I have to put my hand into the gaping gash in his side. Unless I do that, I'm not changing my mind. Thomas's words, I will not believe, are much stronger in the Greek. The Greek would say, I will by no means, no way, no how, believe it. Thomas is now in an all-out battle with doubts. Now, we are not told whether Thomas followed through with what he wanted to do. It doesn't matter. The fact that Jesus made this offer to help him battle his doubts was pure love. We were told at the beginning of our gospel reading that Thomas' surname was Didymus, That means a twin. Is it a stretch this morning to say we are twins of Thomas? Oftentimes, aren't we doubting Thomas's when our spiritual senses battle doubts? Trials and troubles afflict us, and we ask, where are you, Lord? How come, Lord? Why me, Lord? Why again, Lord? Why another surgery, Lord? When we are challenged for believing Easter, we crouch under the back doors of our hearts to avoid persecution and join Peter in claiming, I don't know the man. When the Lord says to us, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, 
Offer your bodies as living sacrifices and your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Do we follow our own will and say, no way, no how? When we're so joyless, so afraid, so worried, so anxious, so guilty, so angry, so burned, so burned up, so burned out, do we, do we doubt God really cares? Or blame everything at his feet? At this point, we're battling our own doubts, and our doubts are winning. And then we are the sorrowful Thomases who are sinning. In the strongest of moments, we are weak. In the finest of our hours, we are wobbly and flimsy and we doubt God. And if we cast him out of our hearts like Thomas did for a little while, he will certainly cast us out of heaven. And then where do the I will not believe it leave us? But in hell's fury forever. And that's a losing battle. Realize the battle we're in. By ourselves, we're not up to the challenge. We are not able to defeat the doubts. Thomas couldn't, and we as his twins can't either. There has to be something better. There has to be someone bigger than our doubts. And there is. And when we battle them, then turn to the Lord Jesus, the risen Savior, and see him as the only proof we need. I'm of the opinion that Thomas's absence from the Lord's appearance the first night, Easter night, was not by chance or coincidence. God used Thomas's attitude so we can see his grace in Thomas's life and in ours. And so a week later, not long, but a week later, Jesus reappears to the same audience, only with Thomas present. And he says, peace be with you. And oh, how Thomas needed to hear that too. And on top of that, Jesus offers Thomas further proof. You want to see nail marks? See my hands? You want to touch the spike holes? Then put your finger into my marks. You, you want to feel my gaping gash? Then put your hand into my side. You want to see proof, Thomas? I'm here in the flesh to give it to you. Don't doubt. Don't be faithless. Just believe it. What grace from a gracious Savior. He will go to any length to allow one soul to believe again and not doubt. What Jesus cares about is that we don't believe the resurrection because we've seen it. What he cares about is that we see his resurrection because we believe it. Thomas finally came around and confessed those beautiful words we all do today, my Lord and my God. You are my risen Savior. And Jesus commends his changed attitude and says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas, there are many who haven't seen me, but they believe the message. They're in church right now in Redeemer in Weston. Blessed are they. They haven't seen me, but they believe me because believing is seeing. By God's spirit working through the gospel, we know and believe that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Our sins have been forgiven. They've been washed away by Jesus' blood. Our hearts are clean before God. Our souls are pure before the majestic holy God because he sees us through the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees us through the perfect righteousness of Christ covering us. 
and sees us not as sinners, but as his people. That's how we are blessed, even though we haven't seen and yet have believed. We can't see heaven, but we believe it's there. We can't see our rooms and the mansions, but we know Jesus is preparing them even as I speak. The blessing of our faith depends on this word of God. Peter once said, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, yet by believing in him, you are filled with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Hebrew writer said it best, and we know it. Faith is being sure about what we hope for, being confident of what we do not see. Battle your doubts whenever they arise, spiritual or physical. Battle those doubts by being sure and by being convinced. And see Jesus' wounds and see his empty grave as proof that you will live in Jesus in paradise forever. Because after all, believing is seeing. Amen.